Yeah, welcome everyone. Uh, beginning in 2018, the Purdue Engineering Distinguished Lecture Series uh, really started uh, inviting uh, world-renowned um, faculty and professionals um, to Purdue Engineering to encourage thought-provoking discussions and conversations and ideas really with our faculty and students regarding the grand challenges and opportunities in their fields. Now, uh, besides presenting a lecture to a broad audience of faculty, uh, grad and undergraduate students, they also engage in an interactive panel with Purdue faculty, other stakeholders, uh, and experts, as well as students. Today's panel is about thermal and energy management challenges in large-scale sustainable computing systems. Uh, truly a grand challenge for engineering that arises at the intersection of exponential growth of the digital data, of sustainability, and new materials and electronics. Now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce the moderator for today's panel, uh, my colleague, uh, Justin Weibel. Uh, Justin is a research associate professor in the School of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue University. He's the director of the Cooling Technologies Research Center, a graduated NSF IUCRC that addresses research and development needs of companies and organizations in the area of high performance heat removal from compact spaces. Dr. Weibel's research group explores methodologies for prediction and control of heat transport to enhance the performance and efficiency of thermal management technologies and energy transfer processes. He has been a key contributor to the development of transformative cooling technologies supported by DARPA, NAVC, ONR, SRC, in addition to numerous sponsored research projects that transition these technologies to industry in projects with funding totaling over $10 million. Uh, Dr. Weibel will be the general chair of IEEE's iTherm conference in 2021 uh, he's associate editor of the IEEE Transactions and Components Packaging and Manufacturing Technology. Uh, Dr. Weibel's academic record includes the supervision of 24 PhD students, 11 master students. He's authored more than 140 refereed journal and conference papers and was recently recognized as an outstanding teacher, engineering teacher by the College of Engineering here at Purdue and received the 2020 ASME Electronic and Photonic Packaging Division Young Engineer Award. Uh, over to you, Justin. Thank you for the introduction, uh, Arvind, and you know my pan panelists are equally and more accomplished than I am, so we'll get to introduce them here in a few moments, but uh, really pleased to moderate the panel today, and, and I'll talk about, and I wanted to start, and maybe I'll just tell everyone kind of what we'll go through, is I'll, I'll read a brief abstract to just kind of set the stage uh, for what the panelists will discuss today before I introduce them, um, and then we'll go ahead and, and have a couple of key topics to do that, so if I if I kind of read a, a short kind of abstract that was prepared and wanted to explain what we'll talk about, you know, it is our digital economy and it's this rapid growth in the applications we know about and hear about, cloud computing, 5G, AI, autonomous vehicles. And all of these data-driven technologies are generating huge amounts of data. And so there's a projections, right? By 2025, we'll have 175 zettabytes of data. And no one knows what a zettabyte is because it's a ridiculous amount of right 10 to the power 21 bytes. And to put it in perspective, the total amount of data in the world that was kind of out there was only a single zettabyte in 2012. So this is really exploding. And all of this data is residing in these large centers that are the backbone of the internet, enabling computation, storage, management of all of this information. Um, and these data centers are extremely energy intensive. To, so they use and consume about 1% um, of the worldwide electricity usage, maybe a little more. And there's projections for various growth models, of whether that's going way up, depending on how we intervene, or can we keep it right at a reasonable amount. But regardless, that's on the same carbon footprint as basically the aviation industry. So it's a massive amount. And in this very big picture challenge, right, of, of large data center energy usage, we can still drill down to like the transistors inside of it. And there you've then you're dealing with heat flux densities equivalent to the surface of the heat flux of the sun. So, right, you've got this multi-scale, right, problem where you have energy and thermal management from a few nanometers to the size of right, football or soccer fields. And so we need to engineer these computing systems to be right, efficient, reliable, and sustainable. And so this is why we need to have right, research at the intersection of this electronics packaging, reliability, techno-economic policy. Um, it's really imperative to these large systems. So our panel today, we've got industry and academic experts. I personally feel that this is a, an area where there's been a great history of industry academic partnerships. 
um, and to discuss their perspectives on how engineers can rise to the challenge of this particular problem and, and talk us through that. So that's the background. Um, I want to introduce our panelists. So I'll kind of just have them say hello. Um, short, short bios here, um, just so we don't take up too much time. But uh, you know, first, uh, Professor uh, Reje Aganafar is our distinguished lecturer. He's a member of the National Academy of Engineering, a distinguished university professor of mechanical engineering at the University of Texas Arlington. He heads not one, but two centers. He's the site director of NNSF IUCRC on energy efficient systems, as well as the director of the electronics systems packaging center um, at, at UT Arlington. And his research is on data center cooling, 3D packaging, and the cooling and reliability of micro um, and power electronic systems. So welcome, uh, Dereje. Great to have you here, uh, of course. Um, Thanks, Justin. Absolutely. Uh, we also have one of our new faculty um, that we're really eager to start working with and collaborating with, uh, Prof Professor uh, Rebecca Chez. She's an assistant professor in mechanical engineering and holds a joint appoint appointment in um, environmental and ecological engineering at Purdue. And her research is at the intersection of technology, economics, and policy to enable transition to decarbonized energy systems. Um, so welcome, Rebecca. And great to have you here. Um, so Dr. Ashish Gupta, he is the director of the Thermomechanical Solutions at Intel's Data Platforms Group. So he leads all thermal and mechanical architecture execution and innovations development for Intel's full technology portfolio. And that's this long list of different technologies and where they insert right, their, their devices. Um, and of course, I'd like to point out always, he was recently recognized as well and will soon be awarded an Outstanding Mechanical Engineering Alumni Award um, for Purdue because he got his PhD here uh, with uh, Professor Jay Gore in 2004. Um, so welcome, Ashish. Thank you for joining. Uh, Professor Carol Handwerker is the Reinhard Schumann Professor of Materials Engineering at Purdue. Uh, she also has a joint appointment, I know, in EEE as well. And her research applies thermodynamics, kinetic theory experiments with phase transformations and interface motion. Uh, to solve important industrial and scientific problems. Um, and I know she's been a lot involved a lot in the adoption or facilitating the adoption of lead-free solders and electronics and a whole host of life cycle analysis, reliability assessment of these systems. So thank you for joining, Carol. Um, and then we have Dr. Uh, Madhu Iyengar, who's a senior staff data center engineer at Google. And so in that role, he's involved in the design and delivery of next generation IT uh, and data center if infrastructure. And I'll point out, he's really a community leader in our field and our community on the industry side in thinking about energy efficient cooling technologies and, and road mapping activities. He's the organizer and has helped uh, been instrumental to writing the chapter on thermal management in the IEEE heterogeneous integration roadmap uh, as well. So very pleased to have him here. Thank you, Madhu. Okay. So now I want to ask some questions and get the discussion going and stop talking myself. Um, so I think we should start as kind of with some icebreakers because maybe many students and others in the audience are not really familiar with these topics. So I, I start with you, uh, Dereje. If someone or a graduate student in the room wasn't familiar with what a data center is, what it entails, why is it consuming all of this energy and, and what are we doing for thermal management? Could you just give us a brief introduction to that to set the stage? Yeah, so um, data center can be a large or small uh, infrastructure that houses electronic equipments, such as servers, storage devices, and so on. And the purpose of it is really to transmit uh, digital information. So we have IT pods that may be a few hundred square feet, like the ones we built, I'll talk about that later. And uh, we have uh, companies like uh, uh, Facebook. I don't think Madhu knows what that is. Uh, just kidding. <laughs> but that has, uh, for example, in the local area in Fort Worth, 800,000 square feet a data center, right? So, and more. So it's, it's, the size can be quite significant and you can certainly appreciate how important it is, uh, especially during the COVID times being able to have access to information. So it's, it's really an infrastructure that houses uh, equipment dealing with digital data. And of course they, they are 
then consuming right large amounts of energy to do that right and and what is produced from that and the inefficiencies is, is a ton of heat right and, and how to manage that um, yes i i could talk about that if you want me to as well no i, I think i think yes. that's um yeah. you know just kind of the premise um so when we talk about it and and so thank you Dereje, and you know i think we've got a couple of industry panelists on too so as she should do i'd kind of kick it to you to say you know, I know this is an area where there's been a lot of progress. If you look at, you know, since the last decade, we all know that the installed capacity is like 500% something else, but we actually haven't used that much more energy for computation. So what, what have people done to solve this challenge is just looking backward a little bit, maybe before we look ahead. Sure. You want me to go first, Justin? Sure. Yeah, sure. Sure. Yeah, I think, uh, you had a huge boom, I think, after the dot-com burst and data center growth in the 2000s. And I think there was an intense amount of scrutiny on energy consumption and efficiency. And a lot of good things came out of that uh, uh, in terms of uh, reducing the cooling consumption, best practices. So I think the last 20 years has been a pretty awesome journey in improving uh, the, reducing the ratio of cooling energy use divided by the power, power use by the IT. And I think where I see is going is that's only part of the story, but the other part of the story is uh, devices are getting more and more po uh, powerful, which means they consume more power, they have higher power density. Part of the reason for that is you know, you have the Moore's law where you keep adding devices and also reducing the length scale of the devices. But you also have something called the end of Denard scaling where until about 2006, as you shrunk the devices, the power consumption also uh, reduced a great deal, but you don't see that happening to that much extent. So what it means is as you put more transistors on a chip, and you don't reduce the power linearly, you're gonna have higher power densities. So relating that back to energy efficiency, the bar is now higher. You need to, you need to do the same highly efficient job with a much harder task of removing heat more, eff uh, more effectively. Yeah, is, it, would it be wrong to kind of say that you know, in the last, we were able to kind of identify there was a lot of low hanging fruit previously, right? We knew of these like horrible inefficiencies, laying out data centers, you know, just, you know, mixing hot and cold air streams. Those things have been resolved and now moving forward, you know, especially with the end of this, you know, on the electrical device side, we could just scale it smaller, reduce power. When that started to end, then it became more and more challenging and it'll be a lot harder going forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly so. Ashish, any thoughts on just that history? Uh, sure. I, I mean, uh, I think you guys uh, said it correctly, uh, but uh, I think the the history piece of it, I think, will continue with us for a little bit longer, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of uh, when we established those huge data centers that Rigi talked about, or even smaller ones, which may be very uh, big cost investment for some of the companies which did that, they want to operate it for all, as long as they can. And at the same time, their data processing needs are continuously increasing. So they're trying to push the limits, right? I think even a small you know, so decimal point improvement in efficiency can actually mean millions and millions of dollars of savings. So I, I do anticipate that uh, the companies will just keep on pushing, optimizing, as they try to upgrade to the newer products which require more power, they don't want to really go about changing the entire infrastructure or building another 800 or a, or, or a thousand or a million square foot uh, data center. So how do I get the latest technology really service my customers in the exis existing infrastructure? Mm -hmm. But I guess in that, so it, it's still going to be, we can live off these kind of percentage gains because yeah. it still means a lot, right? by economically there okay yeah and uh, but at the same time like you started this panel right uh, where you said in 2012 one zeta byte and 2025 175 zeta byte yeah. right 
right? So, I mean, as of now, only ha the half of our data that we have right now was just created in the last past two years. So we have reached this inflection point where entire industries are getting reshaped by leveraging data. So while we see examples of digital transformation emerging, it's important to remember that only less than 2% of the world data has been analyzed, right? It's like, it's like the new oil, right? I think this term has been there for a while that data is the new oil. And just like you dig in and you extract the oil, you have to, that, that data exists, but people, we have not really started drilling it out and being able to use it in an efficient way. Yeah, yeah. But so then I guess that's where I, you know, you kind of say it'll, it'll continue and, and where I kind of ask and would, would be interested in all your opinions on is, so if it is this massive increase, right, all the data was in the last two years, we probably can't make efficiency gains at the same rate of the in, uh, creation of data. There's just no way to have exponential efficiency gains like there are increases in data. So the total use has to go up, right? Oh, yeah. Significantly mm -hmm. yeah. in, in the end. And we can't kind of maintain this level. I think that's kind of the problem we're facing. Exactly. I think, uh, you know, sublinear growth is a popular term, right? <laughs> growth is, uh, is, is going to happen. It's how, how can you reduce the growth of energy with the growth of the business or the growth of the data, data mining, data consumption. So trying to reduce that cost function or energy function or environmental function, mm -hmm. subdue that as much as you can while the actual growth of uh, the internet and the cloud yeah. continues. Yeah. So we're talking about uh, growth of like energy and, and uh, economics and other things. So now is my opportunity to pass it over to uh, Rebecca, I think. Um, you know, your ex you, that's your focus of, of, you know, the lab and group you're establishing at Purdue is this techno-economic assessment. Could, so can you just give us a little background about that and maybe where you see intersections with this community? Sure. So most of my work to date has focused on um, elect electricity energy storage. Um, so somewhat different than data storage. Uh, so you, gotta, you can't just say storage is a shorthand in this talk. Um, but so thinking about how we take technologies that have already been adopted. So for consumer electronics, everybody has a lithium ion battery in your cell phone. Um, but how do you take those kinds of technologies and scale them up into systems that are low cost enough that we would want to use them in our cars or use them um, on our electricity grids to really incorporate uh, more and more renewable energy. And so when you start asking these different questions, um, what might matter a lot in uh, uh, designing a battery for uh, consumer electronics uh, might not be all that important once you get up to these bigger and bigger uh, battery systems. You know, for if you're trying to store energy for eight to 16 hours a day, um, you might have very different requirements than you might have um, when you're thinking about these smaller scale systems. And so how can you best um, manipulate the manufacturing process, kind of change the design at like the fundamental materials level um, in a way that will reduce the cost at the overall system level. Um, so how can you kind of take advantage of those to ultimately build these decarbonized um, energy systems um, to provide the electricity that's reliable enough to power you know, our cars, to switch over to transportation, um, but also providing all of the other uh, electricity that we use, um, whether it's in data centers or just um, in day-to-day -day life. And that's, I, I, I liked the parallel between all of your work on battery systems and battery storage, because you've thought about like the scaling of storage of energy right. from that perspective, and this is on data. And it, I don't know if all the parallels exist, but there are some, and, and I think it is, this is a, a techno-economic driven thing um, yeah. in, in general, and what we can do. And if we need new technologies, um, you know, you know, Dereje, you know about trying to get technology transition, right, from, right, to industry. It's hard and it's driven by, right, a more complex set of things than just, right, good thermal performance or cooling performance or other types of things. Uh, good. Yeah. Uh, do you want me to uh, comment? Sure. sure. Actually, yes. I wanted to say that the projections in electricity usage uh, that if you look at, and I'll show that in a slide later, uh, what was projected, uh, 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 say in 2010, uh, has significantly dropped because of uh, improved management. People like Google and uh, Facebook, hyperscale, 
uh, and hi hyperscale and uh, and the cloud uh, versus ten years ago, they're now going to be ninety percent uh, is going to be hyperscale versus uh, the traditional being ninety percent in two thousand ten, right? So there is a, so we are actually doing a really good job of uh, of uh, improved efficiency. So if you include best practices and, and hyperscale, your efficiency rate really can go down quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, you improve quite a bit and yeah. thus uh, reduce the uh, electricity usage. So, so we're actually doing a pretty good job, we, but we gotta continue to do that. Yeah, yeah. This, the, the idea of just with scale, you can do things at scale you might not be able to do in these small um, outfits. But, but there's always the need for small too, where there's like latency yeah. driven applications and need small, but it, as it migrates and you know, this massive data explosion, I think is, is going to be stored on hyperscale, right? Cisco's. Okay, Carol, it's, I, I wanna involve you too, because kind of the other angle and aspect of this is not the energy use just associated with like, okay, the electricity being consumed, but there's also, these are not, these are item, you know, products with a life cycle that get used and especially the turnover on electrical systems is quite fast and, and the lifespan of them and there's an energy cost associated with that. I know you've worked a lot on life cycle assessment of, of these systems. Can you, can you kind of tell us more about what you've done there and your thoughts? Sure. So, um, we've been talking so far about the fact that, you know, with data centers, when doing a life cycle assessment, you have the original co energy cost and all the other costs. There are like 11 different environmental and human health impacts associated with that. Anytime you, ju just for the manufacturing and putting it into place, there are these costs that are associated with it that have to be divided by N, where N is the number of years that the center is gonna be operating. So it depends critically on what the reliability is, what the business models are associated with the um, replacement of the various parts of this. And it, it's much more nuanced. It is much richer than just figuring out what are the energy costs in a given year. So I've done a lot of work with the um, electronics industry, actually with Google, uh, Microsoft, and Cisco, and Seagate, just in hyperscale data centers for hard drives. So those hard, dri hard drives and SSDs are swapped out every two years. They still have three years of warranty in them, but as was brought up before, you wanna be able to keep scaling the, the services um, and the equipment with, with the demand. So you wanna be able to go up a factor of two or a factor of four in storage. And so keeping the same physical footprint of the facility. So life cycle assessment um, is really sort of retrospective. What one really needs to do is uh, think about this as a circular economy. And Google is really great at this. They sell over a million hard drives a year in the open market that they retire. So, and other systems, they, they sell these sell these in a cascading way through the, the, um, through the world economy. So these are other points just to remember. Yeah, and Carol, I, I said I'd warn you if your audio is cutting out, so we, we did. So maybe you want to go sans right? it's also video. <laughs> but excellent. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, so if maybe uh, Carol, you mentioned before, you might you're going to have to leave Paris and and turn <laughs> turn your video yeah, off. Yeah, yeah. So, but, but is, uh, is the audio better right now? The audio is better now. Yeah. Okay. So basically, there are a lot of different components. I don't know what you heard that was part of that, but um, there are many more components that are actually switched out, and their life cycle costs mm -hmm. and and economic costs associated with those, and it's really important that the more general public out there understand that um, the companies are actually being very aggressive with respect to yeah. making sure they're just not putting these in the trash and that the, the, the energy that's already um, um, 
embedded in all of these products, they, they actually aren't going to waste either. Yeah. And that's another kind of critical perspective of this. And one that's, I don't know, I always talk about and think about is like this hidden energy use that right, can't be ignored. But I think industry does a great job of being aware of that. You know, from a research perspective, what is, you know, I know there's a lot of faculty at Purdue working on life cycle assessment or however, you know, design for life cycle. How, how does research help intersect and affect that process and inform what industry is doing? How do we help in that Respect. So one of the key ways that we can help is that if there are these technological gaps mm -hmm. that we take into account economic assessment, life cycle assessment, uh, logistics as quickly as possible and as early a stage as possible in the technology development. And mm -hmm. because we don't want to develop a technology that nobody's going to use. Mm -hmm. So Just that really, it's been our approach that, you know, for low, these ultra low, low temperature solders that are being uh, developed we're doing it with intel and major companies because we want to make sure that there aren't show shoppers uh, show stoppers along the way and they see it as a critical technology so we're getting involved with basically the whole range of stakeholders uh, suppliers for the new technologies uh, equipment manufacturers you know, we work with LAM Industries, or LAM Research, that is developing a lot of tooling, applied materials, um, and with ASML. So, um, you know, that, that's how we try to, to mitigate the risks of doing things that aren't relevant. So when we're working on, you know, advanced liquid cooling solutions and things, I should be talking to you about whether or not we're using, you know, materials and fluids that have some horrible, right, long-term costs or benefits. And I should be talking to, you know, Rebecca about, you know, other kinds of economic assessments and how much they cost. I think that's the point is that we've just got to, it, it's a big picture. This one is a big picture problem and it's, we won't get, we need lots of creative and good ideas, but to get them mat matured. Uh, early on, we need to consider this even. Uh, right, and also operation working. environments are very important. So I know that Dereje has worked a lot on uh, corrosion effects. So in practice, and uh, um, um, I was talking with um, my colleagues at Juniper the other day where they they talked about a case that they had heard of where the, there's actually a gradient in corrosion from where the air inlet, air comes in to the air uh, that, that uh, leaves the system. So it's, it's all of those things plus the, um, the harsh environments and the different locations where, where things are going to be used. Well, I think, um, you know, we've, we've kind of set the stage a little bit and had some conversation and I hope everyone in the audience now is, is thinking about questions they would have for the panelists. So I'll just say, and, and I, I should introduce uh, Aditya Kandadai is a PhD student, you know, working in this space and area. So he, he's kind of the moderator looking at Q&A. So please do actually use the Q&A function if you have questions for the panelists. Uh, we'll turn to him uh, periodically throughout the event to kind of draw anything, uh, draw, draw up some questions if you have any. So do type them there. Um, I, I don't know, Aditya, if we have any now or if we can go in. I, I have a uh, I have a couple of questions and I, I, uh, from the Q&A that I can uh, have for the panelists right now. Yeah, let's let's do a question from, from the panel okay. or for the so, panelists. Yeah, yeah uh, so there's one question in the Q&A about uh, different levels of liquid cooling solutions for data centers and, and if they can talk about like some of the examples and their opinions about what uh, the future of these and where they, they see the broader adoption of each of these technologies. Mm -hmm. Okay, I can I can start on that one, if that's okay with you, Justin. Anything? Yeah, I'm not here to stop anyone from talking. Go ahead, Ashish. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, uh, tradition. I mean, air, liquid cooling, right? This is about liquid cooling in data centers. I think liquid cooling is already been extensively used in uh, data centers. I mean, first you have something maybe you call as. Uh, free air cooling where you have data centers that's extremely cold temperatures, we're just able to utilize air. But as you try to pack more and more uh, products or uh, 
uh, there's more system densification that happens at the data center. The uh, power goes up. Sometimes, uh, what, what, over time, what we have seen is that uh, more and more companies are moving towards some form of liquid cooling, uh, where either you take the heat away from the in the air and then you cool the air through liquid, and then you uh, companies are trying to bring that liquid closer and closer to the place where the heat is getting generated. Uh, so when it comes to like things like cold plate, they are actually now getting a, quite popular over the last few years. And uh, at some point, I think in the future, we do anticipate that the fluid is going to get even more closer to the silicon. And uh, if you look, if you just Google uh, you know, liquid cooling, uh, micro channels, silicon micro channels, you're going to see a lot of papers, research work happening in that. I, I do see a big uh, hurdle till, till we get that point because it is uh, that's the place where the peak companies which are making the product and the companies which are deploying those products, they really have to come very close to make that kind of a reality happen. Another big uh, shift that we are starting to see right now is something called as immersion cooling. I know this is, has been an area in the industry, in the academia for quite a bit of time. I know Professor Dariji has been working on it for also for a long time. And I'm seeing an explosion of interest in that space. The, some of it is driven by edge computing and uh, the anticipation of 5G coming. The amount of data that is going to get created is going to be so big, so so huge that it is not economical to move that data to a data center and get it processed over there for various reasons. And if this time we can get into it if, or in interest. Uh, so companies are trying to analyze the data, either it's a uh, you know, try to really utilize that oil that I talked about earlier, very close to the place where the data is getting generated. And that's leading to some uh, computing happening at all kinds of locations, uh, altitudes, pollution, and you cannot really have, keep on designing those individual small data centers. So there's something called immersion cooling, where you have a dielectric fluid and you immerse the entire system in the dielectric fluid. So you're not really utilizing even fans in that space. So that, that is uh, becoming very popular recently. And I, I and expect it to uh, really explode in the coming years. I, I can inject too. Yeah, I was going to ask you to, please, please do. Yeah. So I, I think uh, just like she said that, um, you know, obviously you want free cooling uh, if you can, just bring the outside air. In certain environments, you can do that. You know, from a thermodynamics, as you know, you there's what we call a recommended zone. So you have to control, assuming that the barometric pressure is fixed, you need two properties to uh, fix the state. And so let us say that's just the uh, uh, relative humidity and uh, dry bulb temperature. So it has to be in a certain range. So you might be able to do that. And if you shift, it's okay if it's out of there for a while. If that doesn't work, but then what Carol said comes into play here. If you start doing that, then you're going to have some contamination. So you bring the outside air in so you can have some contamination issue. It's a lot. We've done a lot of work in that area. So I certainly can refer you to that. Now, follow up on that free cooling is uh, direct and indirect evaporative heat exchanger, where now you use the latent heat. That's very significant. So unless you are in the southern part of Florida, certain areas where, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, the uh, web bulb temperature uh, does not allow you, you don't, you don't have that delta T to work with. You can do quite a bit of good stuff with uh, uh, direct and indirect evaporative heat exchanger. Direct being better, but indirect if you have to, because it's a lot more flexible. And plus you don't have to worry about contaminating things. So a lot of work in that area and certainly is being used extensively. Uh, people like uh, IBM, I mean, uh, Google and so on and so forth use that extensively for the big data center. It's very current. Start, used to use uh, spray and then cooling media and so on. Then you start talking about uh, indirect liquid cooling. I call it indirect, right? That's the IBM because the, the, uh, the, um, the, uh, 
coolant in this case, water is not in direct contact with the with the device because of uh, it's not a dielectric. So there's a lot of work in that particular area. But I mean, I remember being my IBM days, you know, thermal conduction module. My do I know you know that well? I hate you stuff. So so I've been doing that for since the '80s. But there's a lot of work now in that particular area. You know, using uh, uh, people call it micro, but I'm not sure it's micro. It might be a mini channel. But uh, there's a lot of work in that area. We're we're right now working with a major company, uh, develop. I mean, looking at uh, 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 indirect liquid cooling. So uh, a lot of interest in that area certainly has limitations. Then you start uh, looking at uh, immersion cooling. Uh, the the beauty about immersion cooling is, as you start, I think uh, Madhu alluded to this very well. He's talked about Denard scaling, right? Since early 2000s, right? That the uh, uh, the power stopped scaling as a square root of 1.4. So the power density stopped creeping up. So you had to fix the uh, TD thermal design power, or or uh, the other way looking at it is the the frequency. And so in order to get performance, you got to start putting a lot of, uh, uh, a lot of uh, cores in there, right? So we've been doing that. But as you start moving now, start looking at heterogeneous integration to gain leverage, right? Because the frequency, time between frequencies start to really increase four to five years, right? It's still doubling transistors, but it's taking more, more time. As you start doing this and start looking at heterogeneous integration, where you're stitching a bunch of components either in two and a half D and 3D. That is really not something that a lot of the folks currently looking at, at the data center level, but that's surely coming. And immersion cooling is just a great way of doing it because it couldn't care less because it's dielectric fluid, right? But again, it's the material people that win here too. We, the PUE, you can get 1.03 and stuff, no problem. It's the material compatibility issue one has to work in. Mm -hmm. So there's, mm -hmm. there's a lot of work that needs to be done in that particular area or else it's not gonna sell. Yeah. So and it seems it's yeah. more single and two phase flow. So yeah. Uh, so it, uh, it seems like kind of what you're saying there is and Ashish as well is and and I hear this question a lot is like, you know, liquid cooling, where is it? I guess it's it's always been there. There's this suite of technologies. There's going to be applications that need it, right? Some applications that justify very high powers locally and and for climatic conditions or other reasons. And it's been an inward um, migration, right? Do it freely with air if you can, but different applications, higher power densities, more compact to the point where, you know, when there was the Bitcoin mining craze, it made sense for the density of those systems to do immersion cooling. And so these technologies are there and it's going to be the application that determines it. Um, maybe I'll head, I, I see a question I want to get to um, soon, but just because the term came up and, and one of the trends, and I'd like to just talk about it, or I think make the students and audience familiar with it, because we're going to hear about it a lot um, in electronics and thermal management coming up that you use, Dereje, with heterogeneous integration. Um, so, Mandu, you lead kind of the thermal you know, working group in IEEE for heterogeneous integration. For those that don't know what that term is, what it means, and what it means for us moving forward, could you just say a little bit more about that um, and explain? Yeah, I, I think Derej said it very nicely, right? With the pure, I guess, sub-device level performance uh, getting better, but taking longer to get better. There's a huge uh, exponential growth in innovation and in stitching devices together, uh, putting memory close to the ASIC logic chip, uh, having other functionalities like photonics and uh, uh, maybe stacked memory. So your cell phone is, is not, has a lot of heterogeneous integration, just driven by all that functionality going into that phone. And inside the phone, there's heterogeneous packages. So I think what happens then is uh, purely from conduction, you have uh, conduction resistances, you have uh, dissimilar devices with uh, different requirements of temperature in close proximity. You have devices heating each other. So I think it, it becomes a pretty rich space for uh, thermal research, thermal uh, innovation. So I think 
that is definitely an area that is uh, a big growth area for innovation and research, uh, mm -hmm. which is why you're hearing about it a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And Carol, you, of course, work in this space as well and, and think about some of the materials and mechanical and reliability challenges about putting all of this stuff that used to be separate, forcing it in the same package. There's thermal challenges. But, um, you know, what other challenges do you foresee in that space that you're working on? So there's one um, particularly interesting one that I think most of the audience here hasn't heard about. So if you start having really large uh, dye, and we're working with somebody who has an 85 millimeter by 85 millimeter die. They're very thin. So now you have to take this package and you have to assemble it onto a circuit board and you put solder on that. You think, okay, you just put the solder on, it melts the solder and it makes the, um, you can make the interconnects very easily. The issue is that those packages and some of the ones that uh, Madhu was talking about, they're much more complex than they were before and they warp. They warp like crazy. So even before the solder melts, you have them warping like potato chips. And so with the conventional solders. So we're having issues just in um, minimizing these kind of manufacturing defects. And in addition, we have to be able to, to put all the um, uh, the heat dissipating systems on top of that. We have to bolt them on top of it as well. And if these are warped, we can't do it at the end. We have to actually do all of the processing with the uh, applied load. So it's not just to make the, uh, make the boards, make the components, and you can ignore the, the manufacturing. There are a number of serious uh, challenges with respect to that. And so one of them that came up in a question was, oh, low temperature solders, uh, why would you use those? Well, if we don't heat, have to heat the board and the component up as high, it doesn't warp as much. So, we will, so now we have a driver for low temperature solders. However, their maximum use temperature is not as high as some of the high temperature solders. So there are a number of problems like that that uh, we're dealing with not just in the, um, you know, in the, in the end, do we have a reliable solder joint, but all of that has to take in, be taken into account in design and manufacturing. And we're not gonna be able to, um, to test our way into this because one of the packages that we deal with right now, it costs $5,000 a package. <laughs> so modeling simulation for the whole, mechanical, thermal, electrical function is becoming more important. So those are just a few of those sure. issues. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And, and I see, you know, I'll stick with one more. I'm looking at the Q&A, one more question, because I often see it at kind of the device level, and then we can maybe talk about, you know, again, some of the large scale energy challenges is, you know, there's, there's so much heat generation that we talk about. Are there promising, what's on the horizon for revolutionary ways to store process data? Um, so we're just not generating the heat in the first place. Is that a viable solution and, and what's there? Can, does anyone wanna field that question? I think that's probably for computer scientists, but, but I, I, I agree with you. I, I think storing data, uh, optimizing how you store data, redundant data, and so that is, that is uh, something that, uh, that needs yeah. to be looked at. But uh, interestingly too, uh, listening to Carol, there is so much opportunity for a multidisciplinary work. It really, that's, that is really what I see here. You can't really do, for example, thermal without understanding packaging. You can't really do thermal without understanding materials. Uh, in fact, uh, Ravi Mahajan recently, Ashish, uh, he gave a, uh, received an award and gave a talk and his call to action was, uh, you know, uh, 10 materials that are order of magnitude better. But when you start talking about new materials, you got to ta start talking about their reliability. So those material people don't get away from us at all. <laughs> yeah. Yes. 
Excellent. Um, and there's some actually to the panelists too, if the, you want to field any of the questions by uh, text in the chat too, if, if we don't get to them all. And, and Jay, so Jay Gore asked a question as well. And this is, you know, maybe thinking back about the, you know, the energy uses, is there any way to use all of this heat generation? So is there, are there any viable or promising waste heat recovery uh, where some of this energy just doesn't go to waste? Um, you know, I, maybe I'll say a little bit about that, but then turn it over to the panelists. Certainly it, it's very low grade. So that's one of the difficulties for this, right? The temperatures we're talking about produced by electronic systems are certainly right, you know, less than 80 Celsius type temperatures. And so many of the conventional recovery mechanisms just are not viable. And, and but Jay specifically said, asks about thermoelectric generation to do some right powering of sensors or secondary circuits. Is that anything that is being considered or has been considered um, maybe in the uh, industry say? I can make a comment. I think that's where our technical background actually reveals the drawbacks, as you said, when you calculate the Carnot efficiency and you know, real world devices, maybe uh, the refrigerant based ones, they get to maybe 40% of Carnot. So when you do the math and you do the ratios in Kelvin instead of Celsius, it ends up being, you know, sub 5C, 5% uh, conversion rates. I think, uh, so that is one challenge. The second challenge is for energy conversion, you end up having to put these devices in the heat flow path. And that really hurts the effectiveness or efficiency of thermal, the thermal resistance goes up. So that also is a barrier. I do think there's a home for some of these devices uh, for lower heat flux, lower power uh, applications. And I think sensors and many other lower power, highly distributed lower power applications might have a lot of uh, use case for the uh, advances in these devices. And, uh, just following up quickly, uh, people in uh, IBM, Zurich, and so on, right? They are using a lot of the uh, waste energy, right, for for uh, heating and so on and so forth. So depending where you are, there's a lot of work in that area. Jay, I can send you some information on that as well. So, yeah, that's uh, kind sorry, of... sorry, Ashish, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Ashish. Yeah, I think uh, the way. I'm seeing about energy recovery is that uh, the companies are, when they put out their data centers at large scale or small scale, their goal is not energy recovery. Mm -hmm. Their goal is to meet their needs, which could be performance or it could be cost or, or something else. And energy recovery comes as an afterthought. Uh, however, that's changing. There are, uh, and I think Europe is really leading in the forefront over here. For example, uh, Amsterdam, which has the most number of data centers in Europe per capita, they are not going to allow any new data centers unless you have a plan of how you utilize the waste heat recovery. And really you reuse it in a meaningful way. Uh, so I'm seeing that trend. Uh, I'm seeing uh, countries which are putting limitations that uh, if your PUE is higher than a certain number, then you know you have to pay more taxes or you have to buy back energy credits. So I'm seeing a lot more movement in that direction. And uh, hopefully, since this is such an important topic about uh, your ecosystem, about nature, about sustainability, that I hope that uh, we do come up with a plan of how to utilize all of the heat that's getting generated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think that's the point is that we, we, we can cool some very high power systems and do it, but it's also just the, as the raw energy consumption goes up, how are we thinking about just if there's any other ways to utilize it rather than, um, you know, reject it. And on this, I think, you know, Rebecca, it's a good chance to kind of get your perspective here. I know you've thought a lot about, you know, the whether it's in Europe or corporate policy and how it's evolving towards this sustainability conscious right society and maybe is going to start driving some technology development in those areas. Can you kind of just talk about what's going on in that area? 
Sure. So I would say we're sort of in like the second to third generation of uh, corporate sustainability goals sort of related to energy use and, and how do companies start sort of procure their electricity sources. And so like 10 years ago when solar and wind were still relatively expensive compared to other technologies, there was a lot of effort for uh, companies to buy uh, the equivalent amount of energy that they were using from solar and wind. And so you basically take a year's worth of electricity usage and say, we're going to purchase that much solar or wind electricity. Um, but there really wasn't a drive to actually use all of that renewable electricity themselves, right? So they've, they've introduced more investment into the market to drive um, technology adoption in that sense, but they haven't necessarily uh, transition to 100% renewable or zero carbon electricity. And so more recently, there's been a push to, to move from that kind of offset uh, mentality to actually having 100% renewable or 100% zero carbon um, sources. And so that means you have, you have to adopt a lot more energy storage technology. Um, and so to actually be able to use that renewable electricity later in the day or when there's no sun or wind. Um, and so that's been like a shift as the, the sort of electricity technologies have increased and improved um, over time. Um, and then moving forward, I think there's even a look towards how do you um, even become carbon negative. And so I've seen some different companies who have pledged to um, ultimately have uh, net reductions in CO2 and so investing in some kind of carbon re removal technology. Um, it's still pretty early in, the, in those stages, but, um, and I think a, a lot of technology companies in general um, are sort of on the forefront of that kind of, of thinking. And so it's still pretty early, more looking at investing in um, research and development of technologies that have been proven at like the lab scale, but haven't necessarily been implemented uh, in the market. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that, you know, that, that's exciting because I think it is one if you just look at, you know, there's various statistics and other things out there, but the IT industry, I think, as you mentioned, and a few others in transportation, is at the leading edge, right, are the ones who are trying to make that, right, conversion uh, to, right. Um, you know, at these various stages you talked about. And given and the Josh, fact that there are on the, the scale of, of transportation, there is a su substantial buying power, especially if you're yeah. in these local markets like we're in, in Amsterdam, or Amsterdam or other places where it might yeah. be outsized relative to other industries. Yeah, yeah, Madhu? Yeah, I wanted to make a, maybe an orthogonal point, but related to Purdue education and the students in the in, out, out there. I think you've heard uh, talk about life cycle analysis, uh, a broad multi-year, Thought process. We just heard about, uh, uh, you know, TCO. I think it is important to know that as you try to become champions for new technology in industry, you one of the skills that is useful is is to learn how to do the TCO, uh, almost like a business case, uh, end to end, because if something was super easy to introduce, it would already be used. So there is an element of effort that technology people need to do to uh, make the ends meet. And it may, it may be very hard, it may be tough, ROI may be 15 years, but that is really a, a very important skill for even heat transfer people. Uh, if you want to make your energy recovery technology case, you kind of have to figure out how does it make sense business-wise with regulations, without regulations, and then you do have to sell it. Yeah, yeah. And that's a hard thing I, I can admit, and I don't know if anyone else wants to be, confess here, but it's hard, it, it's easy to go to thermal management conferences or other fields, and it's often you, you kind of stop at, um, you know, heat flux or you stop at a temperature for a technology development. Um, you know, we know what immersion cooling, we know what even embedded silicon cooling can do, but it can't stop there, right? That's not what's going to get, feel, get insertion of the systems. And it, that's a very uh, difficult thing to translate across. I, I hope that, you know, these panel discussions raise awareness of that, if nothing else, to try and speak outside your domain. Because the success does depend on being aware of actually getting this thing in. Yeah. And it's not a solo activity, of course. Also, when you run through the TCO or the case and you might fail, you might fail for a couple of reasons, market's not big enough or something. But when you do that effort and then you're watchful, that assumption may change in five years or 10 years, and then you can come back. So I just wanted to, it's not directly related to the panel, but I think it's no. an important 
I tend to be cognizant of that. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it is. I think it is actually directly related or an important aspect of this to, to think about. Okay, I, timing wise, you know, we've got a few minutes. Aditya, I don't know if you have anything um, that, you know, that hasn't uh, been brought up that we should so ask. Yeah, there is one that uh, Dr. Gupta kind of briefly uh, alluded to with respect to PUE. So uh, there's been a lot of focus on, you know, industry getting down the PUE and it's it's been going down steadily. Uh, and the goal is to get it as close to one, right? So the question is, um, what needs to be done to create a drastic reduction in the IT energy consumption that's coming to, to keep it close to that value of one? And, and also theoretically, like, um, what can we do to keep it as low as possible? And what's the theoretical minimum? Yeah, I mean, one comment I would say is PUE is a ratio. So it's a ratio of the total energy or power of the data center to the power of IT. So it does, it does uh, define how efficiently we are reducing the parasitic losses, but changing the denominator is also very important. So ultimately the total electricity bill is what matters or also matters, very important. Yeah, I uh, wanted to uh, uh, add there that uh, we have really been doing a lot of good work in efficiency. And uh, like I said, uh, when you talk about the improved management and the hyperscale, big change, right? To the hyperscale systems, uh, right? Ashish uh, versus yeah. the traditional, the significant change, almost flip. Uh, that is uh, definitely saving on energy. But then you also got to talk about at the, at the uh, component level, uh, when you start uh, uh, you know, uh, putting things together, uh, like uh, this uh, 3D stacking and two and a half D and so on, I think uh, I'm not sure that the, uh, that the data center community, it was certainly people like uh, Ashish and them who make uh, Intel who, who make this device are aware of it, but I'm not sure that the data center community is ready to see how do, how do I cool a uh, heterogeneous integrated system where I have uh, you know a microprocessor and memory stacked on top of each other and several of them, or maybe might be using uh, your uh, uh, either two and a half D or Emmet the, uh, the Intel uh, embedded bridge of that. Yes, so uh, I'm not sure we're prepared for that. So the other thing I also wanna say from an education point of view, I really encourage uh, universities that talk about heat transfer to have a, a packaging class that also includes uh, materials, right? And so on, and certainly uh, about the uh, uh, ROIs and the business cases that uh, that Madhu is talking about, but I, I think it's needed. Otherwise, you get left behind. You might start saying, I'm doing micro channel, right? And then you find out, oh, this daggone micro channel is nothing but a clogging nightmare, right? You keep saying you're focused on, we all know that the heat transfer coefficient inversely proportional hydraulic diameter, right? So I'm, it's not about just getting that to zero, right? And going to infinity. There's a lot of other things, right? You know, pressure drop and so on. So how do you understand the, the system, both from a packaging, I talk about this two and a half D, the stacking and so on. Are we anticipating that? And then the education, how are we integrating these things as we start teaching? Because uh, you can't just teach thermal management course without understanding packaging. So uh, yeah. maybe Justin, you might say a word or two on that. Yeah, let, maybe I'll say a word or two on that only because there's a lot of recent activity going on at Purdue in this area. I should just, you know, because there's students on the line as well. Um, and, and Carol knows this and is involved, but Purdue is part of, of a, a national effort um, to kind of help improve awareness of packaging, even at the undergraduate level in the curriculum, because it, you know, electronics are such a ubiquitous system and the packaging of electronics touches so many things that there's people from all fields who don't have an awareness of basically the assert insertion of them from a thermal materials, radiation hardening perspective and various other challenges. And so with, you know, Purdue, 
in, in collaboration with Arizona State, Georgia Tech, SUNY Binghamton mm -hmm. has right excellent resources in this area. We're actually co-developing and co-teaching across those universities, a junior level kind of awareness course um, for students who are interested uh, in packaging. I don't know, Carol, do you want to say any more on, on that? But it, that, it's completely true, right? We need this, we need education on, on that whole yeah. um, area and even the electrical circuit design. So the other thing that we are trying to do is insert problems, even in the first year of engineering where they're learning how to handle data and use graphing programs and do statistics. We're inserting some of those, uh, some of the topics related to packaging and even heterogeneous integration, radiation hardening into the first semester freshman year, because we don't want to wait until they're juniors to say, oh, and by the way, look at all of this, these issues with respect to packaging. So we're working very hard to just introduce this in the core courses, in introduction to materials, uh, electrical engineering 101, uh, first in um, uh, circuits. Uh, so it's really a, a holistic approach to get the students to be aware of these as early as possible and so that they can build on it, that it's not, okay, you have to take, you have to take thermodynamics and heat and mass transfer and all these things. And then once you are anointed, then you can take the advanced heat transfer course or some packaging course. No, they've been exposed to it along the way. It's awesome. Yeah, yeah, that, that so, is the goal is to just uh, We're very excited about this, you can tell. Yeah, yeah, it's a really um, fun thing and that is the goal. So I see Arvin's picture, uh, which I guess means you're, you're going to tell us that we're out of time. <laughs> um, Fascinating, out of time, but I can see no lack of energy here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we, we could we could keep going, but but I I, I know many of us want to hear uh, Derije's talk as well, so we should. Uh, yeah, I, yeah I'd here. like to just uh, add uh, you know to all the participants here. Uh, please note that, in, and including by the way, our guests, our panelists, uh, Ashish and Madhu, please feel free to join us for uh, Derije's uh, talk. He's giving the distinguished lecture. Uh, in just 15 minutes from now at uh, 4.30 p.m. Uh, and uh, a real thanks to all of uh, the panelists and to Aditya for uh, supporting the Q&A at the back end of this. Uh, really exciting panel, truly a grand challenge uh, moving forward uh, for the next few decades. So really appreciate the great discussion. Uh, and uh, again, I invite all of you to join uh, Dereja's talk here, uh, the invited lecture uh, at 4.30 p.m. Thank you.